um, attending this webinar. We're talking today about students' perceptions of the community of inquiry in a blended synchronous delivery mode. Uh, hopefully by the end of the webinar you will know what that means. Um, and so I'm going to give you a brief overview of the presentation today. It is a traditional webinar, so there is a presentation portion and then we'll uh, be answering questions. The uh, presentation is recorded, so if you choose to ask a question, uh, turn your camera on and uh, microphone on, you, it, it, it may be recorded. Um, however, during the presentation, we'll keep those off <clears throat> just because we want to save a bit of bandwidth. Uh, so if you have any questions at any time, use the chat. You've seen already that Christine is there to answer your questions. Sasson is also with us. Uh, and she will introduce herself in a few seconds. Um, and uh, at the end, you will be able to turn your cameras and microphones on. And then if you have any questions, uh, we can actually have a, a verbal conversation. Um, and so basically today we're going to start with, I'll introduce myself and Sasson is going to introduce herself. We'll talk about the context of my research, uh, the Cégep de la Gaspésie des Îles, the, the situation there. Uh, I'll briefly talk about the course de delivery modes in the community of inquiry and then we'll finish with the findings and implications of this research. So as you may have read uh, in the summary, this is based on my uh, research that I did for the master's uh, degree with uh, Sherbrooke University. So I'm Anne-Marie, I'm teaching at the Cégep de la Gaspésie des Îles. I've been teaching here for nine years now. Uh, prior to that, I taught in, in France, in South Korea and Australia. When I started teaching here, I felt like I needed a bit more of a... Uh, I guess, pedagogical angle to my teaching. I was a content expert, uh, but I was looking for a more pedagogical strategy. So I enrolled in the master teacher program with uh, Sherbrooke University. Uh, it's been a great, great journey, lots of uh, very interesting courses. And through that, I uh, started doing my research on, uh, on the blended synchronous delivery mode and uh, students' perceptions of the community of inquiry. So that's what I'll be presenting uh, today. And I'm presenting with uh, Sasson. Sasson is my uh, thesis supervisor, and I'll let her introduce herself. So, hello, everybody. I'm an associate professor at the University of Sherbrooke in education. Uh, and as she said, I supervised her research on blended learning. And uh, I'm doing myself uh, a lot of research on blended and online learning, and I'm focusing uh, very much on persistence in uh, these kind of courses and programs. So, thank you, Anne Marie, for being here. <laughs> Great, thanks, Austin. Uh, it's the first for me doing a webinar, so please be understanding. Um, and again, if you have any questions, chat box down there, and Austin is going to see your questions. Um, all right, originally we were going to do a, a bit of a Kahoot to make this more interactive but we'll keep this for the end if we have uh, enough time. So let me start with the context of my research. Um, traditionally, there was no distance education in the system. Uh, those of you who remember when you were in school, uh, it was the traditional format with the teacher in class and the students sitting and receiving information. In 1993, there was the uh, education reform in Quebec, and there are three key points here, the second one being the DMS report in 2014, and over the period of 2012 to 2021, there were different social economic factors that affected uh, the Quebec society and the need for distance education. So uh, the reform in 1993, if you look at it from a before and after perspective, basically before the, the, uh, the pedagogical approach was the stage on stage. So you would have a teacher in front of the class and what Paulo Freire called the banking model of education. So basically the teacher has all the knowledge and they deposit the knowledge in students' minds. It was a more passive um, approach to education. After the reform, we saw uh, teachers more as a guide on the side. And so before the reform, isolation uh, learning was mostly done in isolation, whereas after that there was more interaction and collaboration uh, that was put in the uh, educational system. Um, a few years later, in 2014, um, Guy Demers produced a report uh, because we were noticing that in the province of Quebec there was a demographic decline. Uh, between 2011 and 2021, the student decline uh, was of a 16% drop, which is huge. And then we, would, we saw that uh, more people were going to retire, yet there was still a lot of technical labor uh, demands. So the report really tackled the issue of offering in all regions of Quebec accessible training, 
and diversified uh, training. If anybody wants to read that report, it is very thick and very interesting, uh, but I just gave you a brief summary of the key points. So if we look on a timeline, basically in uh, 2012, baby boomers were celebrating their 66th birthday. Um, in 2014, we foresaw that there would be a decline in the workforce uh, between 15 and 60, 60, uh, 64 year olds. And by 2021, uh, baby boomers were mostly expected to have retired, meaning that there would be a 1.4 million jobs vacant and a 5.3 unemployment rate, which is uh, quite high. Therefore, uh, if we look at the case of the Gaspésie Peninsula, because as I said, I'm a teacher at the Cégep de la Gaspésie des Îles, uh, there was a recession in the 1990s. The Chandler Mill closed, the Murdochville mine closed, the fishing and forest industries uh, were also greatly affected by the recession, and this uh, ended up in a loss of about 5,000 jobs, 20% uh, unemployment rate, which is very high, uh, and so a lot of people were really relocating to, uh, to bigger cities uh, to find work, and so the impact of that is that a lot of schools uh, in small towns in Gaspésie were closing, um, some of them had to turn to multiple grade uh, classes, and uh, so one teacher teaching different levels, and also uh, some programs at the SEGEP level were suspended, and some teachers also uh, lost their job. So in the Demers report, uh, looking at the situation, the global situation in Quebec, the idea was that institutions have to collaborate with one another rather than uh, compete with one another. Uh, we wanted to increase access to education to fill those uh, employment opportunities that were going to come up and one of the uh, strategies was to diversify course formats and that's where distance education was suggested uh, originally as a way to help with the shortage of trained professionals and so a lot of people were using CGEP à distance or uh, doing their ACS uh, for example you could have uh, someone who had been working as a secretary for many years she did not have the actual diploma uh, he or she and so to keep that position, they needed to have that, uh, that certification and uh, training. And so because <clears throat> they're working during the day, they've got uh, family responsibilities at night, uh, it's good for them to have access to distance education to be able to get those credentials. And over time, this, uh, this idea of increasing access to different course formats was extended to SEGEPs and universities. And basically the whole idea of distance education, when you think about it, is um, giving everybody more access to uh, education. And so that's for the context. Now, distance education is very, very, very broad. I just put a very small continuum here to give you an idea of um, you know, what it is on one end and the other end. So on the first left hand for you, yes, uh, it's fully face-to-face. -face. So that's the traditional model. You're going to have the teacher in class and the students are sitting in class and that's it. And then at the end of the continuum, you see that it's fully online. So they, they will rarely or even if ever meet uh, face to face. And it's going to be a format that is fully online. In the middle is where you're going to find different delivery modes. Uh, and then the terminology, there's no consensus on the terminology. So you'll hear uh, high flex, multi-access, blended, hybrid. There's lots of different names. And uh, really the idea is that when you're in a blended delivery mode, the online activities are meant to prepare students for face-to-face -face activities. So let's say they would have to research a concept, uh, understand material, uh, you can use the flipped classroom, for example, uh, strategy. And then class activities can actually be a, a threshold for online activities. Uh, and so, for example, you can do icebreakers, explanations, and so forth. So they, the, the, the two ends on the continuum can be combined to, together into something that we can call blended. Um, it's important just to clarify terminology here. I like this image. It's old, it's blurry, but it really uh, explains very well the difference between two words that you're going to hear, which are asynchronous and synchronous. And so asynchronous, it's not in real time, and synchronous is in real time. For example, what we're doing right now, I'm speaking and you're following from a distance, is synchronous, whereas asynchronous um, is uh, that this presentation is recorded and then people can watch it uh, later on. Again, if there are any questions, you could put them in the chat box. Do we have anything so far, Sasa? 
Nope. No, everything is okay for the questions. All right. So I took this from Laval University. It's a, it's a very interesting representation of what you can do with the continuum that I showed you before. It, you can look at it kind of as a math problem, basically. Uh, so how much time do you want to dedicate online and how much time do you want to dedicate face-to-face? -face? Uh, if you look at scenario A, 80% of the, 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 the course is going to be face-to-face. -face. So basically it's the traditional model, mostly of uh, lectures and exams, and then 20% online where students are going to do exercises, practice, watch a few videos. Scenarios B and C also give different ideas. And then scenario D is, is very interesting because that's the um, high flex model, which gives students high grid flexibility. Um, and so you see that basically between 0% and 100% of the course delivery mode can be done. Uh, either the student decides whether they want to attend face to face or online. So it can be that a student has to work that day, that they've got family responsibilities or something else, and therefore they can choose to be attending the course in person or at a distance. So you see that the, the, the range of possibilities is, um, is huge for uh, different course delivery modes. Now, the one that I focused on for my research is the blended synchronous delivery mode, and I'm using uh, Lacal and Meyer's definition of this delivery mode. Basically, the idea is that we've got asynchronous and synchronous online learning happening, um, and participants at a distance can be integrated, and we use means of video conferencing or web conferencing to make that happen. So an example is at the CEGEP of uh, Gaspé, we will have a course that is taught in person with the teacher and the students in Gas Bay. And then we have a video conferencing equipment that allows people from, let's say, the Carleton campus to uh, follow the course at the same time, so say synchronously. However, there can be also some asynchronous activities happening online. Again, it can be a uh, flipped classroom watching videos, uh, doing activities, group work, and so forth. So we'll get to that after. Um, if there's anything that is not clear, again, please use the chat box. I would like to add something to this yes. one, uh, Anne-Marie, yes. is that, uh, you know, in the definition of blended synchronous uh, learning, uh, this comes from Australia because they are doing a lot of experiments there. Um, you can have people from multiple sites uh, following the course, or you, ha you can have people from two or three sites, what we call in um, the, the FADIO project, we call that multi-site. Uh, and the other one, we, we call it, um, I think, uh, I don't remember the, the exact term, but all these modes are all um, in the definition of what we call the blended synchronous learning. Thank you. Thank you, Anne yes. Marie. Excellent. And, uh, and, and that's where it's so important to clarify because it, it blended is, imagine a blender, basically, and you chuck everything in, right? And so <laughs> there can be very different ways of looking at it. Thanks, Austin. Um, and so if we look at the case of the Cégep de Gaspésie des Îles, it's a very interesting uh, situation. Before I started working on my research, I hadn't really realized the extent to uh, which this Cégep is... Uh, is uh, unique in itself. We have a campus, obviously the main campus is uh, in Gaspé. There is also a national school, l'EPAC, École des Pâches et Aquaculture. Uh, we have three research centers, Mérinov, uh, CIRAD, which is the Centre de Recherche d'Aide au Développement Durable. There's also Nergica, which works on uh, renewable energy. We have a continuing education center, uh, which is Collegia. Uh, there's also another campus in Carleton, which is three hours away from here, and then we even have a campus on an island, uh, the Magdalene Islands. And so it's a, it's a very big machine, and to make all this work together, uh, distance education came as a, um, as a, as a, great, uh, as a great tool for us. Um, examples of what we do, for example, and also for distance education, like the relevance of distance education, um, distance ed education can help meet the needs of the labor market. Uh, in the situation I'll explain later, we were expecting a shortage of uh, uh, certified nurses, and so then by offering distance education, we were able to uh, cater to that need. Um, keeping certain programs open, for example, in medical archives, 
uh, we teach the program for the CEGEP here, but we don't have enough students to start a cohort. However, when combined with Limualu, we have enough students. So it helps keep certain programs open. Uh, combining small cohorts, uh, for example, in social sciences, again, we didn't have enough students in Gaspé and in on the Magdalen Islands, but when combined together, we were able to start the cohort. Um, we can also access expertise from other schools. Uh, we don't teach the paramedics program at the CEGEP here in Gaspé, but our students can access it because of distance education with uh, Rimouski. Hi, Nelson. Uh, there's also access to courses with a uh, low number of uh, student enrollment. Uh, let's say that you have a student in Sétil who needs to take a philosophy or English as a second language course uh, at night because it won't fit their schedule. We're not going to have one teacher for that student. However, if we combine all the individual students across the province of Quebec, then we have enough students to start a group and then one teacher can, uh, can be teaching, let's say, for example, from uh, the, the Gaspé campus to the uh, other campuses. We've shared our expertise uh, with uh, different countries, including Haiti, uh, Morocco, different Canadian provinces in BC, uh, in New Brunswick. Uh, even the United Nations came a few years ago to, um, to congratulate us uh, and highlight the, uh, the work that we've been doing in distance education. And um, the, uh, the situation really started at the CEGEP in 20, well, 2007. At the time, we were expecting a, a shortage of uh, certified nurses in the region, in Gaspésie de Madeleine. Uh, and the nursing program was taught only from the Gaspé campus. Uh, and so we equipped classrooms with video conferencing equipment. That's what we were using back in the days, 2007, so that's, uh, that's 12 years ago. Uh, just for your information, it was about $50,000 to equip a classroom, one classroom, and the equipment was good enough to last six to nine years. Uh, we put the uh, video conferencing equipment in classrooms in Gaspé, uh, LEPAC, the National School in Grand River, uh, Carleton, and even at the hospital. So to make it easier for auxiliary nurses who wanted to become certified nurses, uh, they could have access to this education from their workplace. And so this is what we call the, uh, well, it's an example of the blended synchronous delivery mode. And uh, you've got a representation here uh, just of what it was like for us. So there's a big television and a in a classroom uh, with a camera and a microphone and then students are uh, sitting in class with the teacher and another group is attending uh, synchronously, so at the same time from another campus. The uh, technology was fantastic, very expensive, but also very sensitive. And so with the microphones in the classroom, if somebody uh, moved a, a sheet, a piece of paper, dropped a pencil, it was like a bomb for the students at a distance. So great technology, but had certain uh, limitations and we'll get to that in a few minutes. So basically the question that my research tackled is, well this is all great, but are both groups given equal learning opportunities? I've got students attending face-to-face -face with the teachers and students attending at a distance without the teacher. So the idea with anything in education is that we want students to get a chance to learn and so do they have the same learning opportunities? That's what I was looking at with my, uh, with my research. So I'll give you the research question, but I'll sum it up. In the three of the Cégep de la Gaspésie des Îles uh, de la Madeleine nursing program courses taught in the blended synchronous delivery mode, is there a difference in the perception of presence as defined in the community of inquiry framework elaborated by Garrison and uh, Anderson and Archer in 2000 and later revised by Shane Bigerano <clears throat> between face-to-face -face students and those at a distance? I'm going to explain the community of inquiry framework in a few seconds. Um, you understand the blended synchronous delivery mode. So basically, by having students face to face and students at a distance, were they given the same learning opportunities? So did they have the same perception of the community of uh, inquiry? Again, if there are any questions, you can put them in the in the chat there. So far, so good. Okay. All right. So the community of inquiry, if you look at this, uh, this metaphor of uh, the blind man and the elephant, basically, you know, they're each touching a different part of the elephant and they're saying, well, it's a wall, it's a tree, it's a snake, it's a sphere, it's a fan. Um, so in isolation, they don't really have access to the bigger picture. But when they put all this knowledge together, well, they can see or realize that it's an elephant. And it's the same idea for the, the, the learning experience of students uh, through collaboration and interaction. They negotiate meaning and they can better understand 
uh, the content. Um, and uh, Lev Vygotsky said that little quote you see at the bottom there, interaction with teachers and peers is necessary for knowledge to emerge. Knowledge can emerge in isolation, but it's, it's not as efficient and uh, also it may not be as deep and meaningful as when you do it through collaboration and uh, interaction. So this is a nice little metaphor for the community of uh, inquiry. There are three major thinkers or um, three major um, uh, yeah, philosophers that uh, help build this uh, community of inquiry framework. So we start from 1929 with John Dewey when he, uh, he came up with the uh, constructivism framework and then Piaget later on in 53 with uh, cognitive constructivism and finally in 62 uh, Lev Vygotsky with uh, social constructivism. Constructivism you can think of it as a chair um, and so when you put all the parts together then it becomes a chair. So sort of the same idea with knowledge you put different people together and they construct the knowledge together. Social constructivism meaning that you do it with people. Cognitive constructivism was mostly done in, uh, in, in a more of an um, isolated way. It's the, the traditional way of looking at education. So these three uh, frameworks helped build the community of inquiry uh, framework, which was designed by Garrison, Anderson and Archer in 2000, originally. And basically what they were saying is that we need to have three main presence when we're uh, learning. And so the, 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 the first presence that we're looking at is the, the teaching presence. The teaching presence is going to be felt when the teacher reviews students' uh, comments or uh, their responses, when the teacher keeps discussion moving uh, in, uh, in class activities, when they're drawing out inactive students, when they will adjust an activity as it is taking place, uh, when they're learning, uh, they're, they're scaffolding uh, learner knowledge, when they're using a variety of assessment techniques, so not just the same exam all the time, uh, when they're diagnosing misconceptions, um, when they're giving explanatory feedback, for example, uh, when students are sharing ideas, if the teacher is making links among those ideas, we feel that teaching presence. Um, and of course, when the teacher is, uh, is suggesting more explicit learning strategies, we feel that teaching presence. So again, prior to the 93 reform, the teaching presence was major, and that's really what, what, what we saw, a teacher who's sharing information uh, with students. However, in the community of inquiry model, we're also talking about the social presence. And the social presence is, is um, we'll, we'll see that the, like the different indicators of a strong social presence will be when students display strong cohesion uh, as a group, when there is collaboration, uh, when there's open communication with the students, uh, effective expression, when they're sharing uh, their emotions, and it requires a lot of uh, intellectual focus and, uh, and respect. And then the third presence that they, they were talking about is the cognitive presence. And basically that's, that's sort of the level of critical discourse that, we're, uh, that is taking place when students are learning in the classroom. Um, and a good uh, example of that is the Bloom's taxonomy that you see uh, here, that little pyramid there. Uh, it's the different levels of uh, cognitive, uh, cognitive levels, yes, different cognitive levels. So you see that at the bottom, the most basic one is remember. So if I give a vocabulary test to my students and they basically have to just write down certain words in isolation, that's the, the, the lowest cognitive level. However, if I have my students use in real life context those uh, words, then they're creating something, and that's a higher cognitive level. And so the cognitive presence is, is, is the level of critical discourse that is going to be taking place in the learning activities. Later on, Shane Bigerno added a, a fourth presence, which is the learner presence. The learner presence is going to depend on individual traits. For example, uh, students' personality, uh, their motivation, their feeling of self-efficacy. Can I do this? Am I actually able to do this? Uh, there are metacognitive skills. So when they're learning something, do they actually reflect on how they're learning, what strategies they're using to learn? Uh, their self-regulation also, the effort they put in, and even the, the learning style. Um, for example, some students may see failure as a fixed rate. I failed, that's it, that's all. Other students may see failure as something that is controllable. It's a condition that they can control, and it's also a learning opportunity. 
So these four presences, when you put them together, uh, you find that at the intersecting center, we can have a deep and meaningful learning experience. And that's in any course format. So whenever we're designing a course, whether it's you know, entirely face-to-face, -face, entirely online, blended, high-flex, multi-access, uh, if we take this into consideration, uh, we're designing a course where students have more chances of uh, reaching a deep and meaningful learning experience. Now, this is for the, um, the, the, the community of inquiry. So I just want to make sure that the format is clear and see if there are any questions at this point. Awesome. Anything in the chat? No, okay. nothing. Oh, it needs a it's clear? Okay. Good. All right. Don't hesitate, anyone, if there's uh, anything you want to clarify. So basically, when we look at the blended synchronous delivery mode, it's got benefits and it's got challenges. Uh, the benefits, of course, are flexibility and access. Uh, for example, geographically isolated people like me, I'm in Gaspé. Gaspé in Micmac means land's end. And so I'm very, very isolated. If I want to have access to education, distance education and a blended synchronous delivery mode can help me achieve that. Uh, people with disabilities. It can also help them, let's say they're in a, a wheelchair, they can't make it to uh, a building where a, a course is being taught, well, they can access from distance education. Uh, there's also uh, people with their work and family schedules. Uh, it gives them flexibility as well. What we find also is that in research, we saw the quality of learning experience and the learning outcomes can be actually enhanced through distance education. Again, if this is done right, quotation marks, uh, we can use a variety of, uh, of uh, strategies, uh, concept maps, tutorials, uh, peer review. Uh, there can be some blogs, some podcasts, um, debates, reports. It, it just it echoes their daily lives because um, the cloud is part of their lives. And uh, in terms of insti institutional benefits, we also see that some schools will have limited classroom space. And so by offering distance education, they can fit in more students in a group without having to have the physical space. Uh, it can increase the student-teacher ratio, uh, decrease traveling time. Let's say that you're living uh, in the banlieue in Montreal. Uh, instead of having to commute two hours in traffic, you can actually access education from uh, the comfort of your home. Um, and uh, also, it, it prevents teachers from repeating a lesson. If a student misses a class, uh, they can actually access it from a distance, so I don't have to take my office hours and repeat five, six, seven times uh, what was missed. Um, and uh, it can diversify student body. So, for example, I could have, instead of having the cocoon of the gas based students, I can get the diversity of having students from uh, Quebec City, Shawinigan, Sherbrooke, and so forth, uh, which can be very rich when you have a classroom environment. And uh, it also helps with uh, enrollment numbers. So there's a lot of great benefits to this delivery mode. However, there are challenges as well. Um, one of the main ones is institutional support in the sense that you can't just put a camera and say, here, we're making education accessible. The equipment has to be reliable. A lot of research says that students enjoy it when it feels as if they're in the same room, so they don't feel that barrier of uh, technology. Uh, there's also the additional workload of the course design. Uh, for instance, at the CEGEC here in Gaspé, I know that teachers are getting 20% extra prep uh, to design a course. So that's very important. Uh, and that's part of the institutional support. And the training as well. Um, I put Maslow's Pyramid at the bottom there, where you see that if, if, if you don't have your basic needs met, you're not really in the mood for self-actualization. right? And a lot of teachers were telling me that the techni technological aspect of uh, blended synchronous delivery mode makes them feel a bit uneasy. And so because of that, they're not willing to try different strategies and, you know, they just want the camera to work. You know, they want to know that when they push a button, the end of the world is not going to happen. Um, and then there's the teaching presence, which is very important and more so uh, in a blended synchronous delivery mode. I like to think of it as uh, super teachers. Because the students are not all self-directed learners, um, and uh, the teaching presence is going to help foster the different, presence, uh, the different presences as well, cognitive, uh, learner presence, and the social presence. Um, students can be critical of the teaching presence sometimes, 
Uh, some of them will feel neglected because the teacher is giving more attention to the students online or vice versa. Some are going to be annoyed because they become the center of attention. So when the teacher remembers that there are students online and they'll say, and what does everybody think online? Um, when the teacher is busy troubleshooting with techn technological aspects also, some students can be uh, a bit critical of that because they feel like they're missing precious time, precious material as, uh, as well. Uh, we're talking about the importance of building a relationship with the students, not only online, but at a distance. Some students uh, say that the teachers seem to be overcompensating uh, for the format by giving too much attention to a specific group. So striking that balance is, is an art in itself. Um, the tone and the pace also are very important uh, so that the students feel like the, 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 the tone is warm, the teacher is welcoming. Um, and uh, sometimes the teachers have to repeat certain information that the students at a distance uh, did not quite catch, but that repetition can mean that some students face-to-face uh, -face will feel like, uh, like they're a bit bored. Uh, in terms of course design also, we're talking about uh, challenges still. Uh, when you're teaching in a blended synchronous delivery mode, it's not a direct translation of your course. You can't just copy and paste. You have to redesign, and so that takes time. Thus, the uh, additional 20% that institutions can give. Uh, we want to focus on pedagogical principles. We're not focusing on, um, you know, just using technology for the sake of using technology. And it's important to vary our pedagogical approaches and uh, to use alternate group strategies. Uh, I remember when I was in the master teacher program, uh, in some courses, it was just the online students together all the time. Other times, it was the online students combined with the face-to-face -face students. So that varies the uh, strategies, but it also affects the social presence and therefore the cognitive presence and the learner presence. Um, the importance also of uh, back-channel communication. We're using the chat today. Uh, Sasson is very helpful with that. It's important to have some sort of back-channel communication so that it's not just the camera and the microphone. Maybe give them a, a phone number to call if there's anything, um, email address uh, and so forth. And, um, and uh, the teachers have to be basically in the end confident and flexible in this course delivery mode. Uh, I really like this quote from uh, Cunningham which, which sums up a little bit how a, a student can feel when we were looking at the challenge of the delivery mode, uh, which is that online students can be silenced or rendered deaf or blind at the flick of a switch. And that I remember also sometimes when I was uh, as, as a student in the MTP, the Master Teacher Program, where just a technical issue would happen and then all of a sudden I couldn't see anymore, I couldn't speak anymore, I couldn't hear anymore. So it can be challenging uh, with this format. However, again, we're looking at how the benefits are very great. And if we are aware of these challenges, when we design our courses, then we can reap all the benefits from the uh, column on the left side. Questions or comments at this stage? Austin, do you see anything in the chat? No? Okay. All right. So um, I'm not going to give you all the, the, the specific scientific details of the research, but basically my research was done in 2017. I was looking at three nursing courses taught in the blended synchronous delivery mode uh, in Gaspé, and, and uh, we were using video conferencing at the time still. Uh, and so you had a group in Gaspé with the teacher, and then another group was attending from a distance. Uh, we gave the students a questionnaire, the Community of Inquiry questionnaire. It's got 48 questions. And uh, we got, this was mixed research, so we got qualitative and quantitative data. Quantitative data being that we average out, you know, it's, it's a Likert uh, scale question. So on a scale of uh, 1 to 5, uh, how did you perceive an uncertain element? So we did the, uh, the, the tests, the standard deviation, everything to get the quantitative data. And then for the qualitative data, it was uh, students' comments. And this is very rich because they, they shared a lot of information that I'm going to uh, show you in a few minutes. Just to give you an idea of the three different groups I looked at, we had first-year students, second-year students, and third-year students. So three different groups taught by different teachers. Um, and in each group, there were students attending face-to-face -face and students attending at a distance. 
it's always interesting to look at demographics when we ask questions. And so I just wanted to highlight briefly the fact that 57% of the students um, uh, were working part-time. So this can be a reason to enroll in a in distance education course, but it can also be a factor why some students may not uh, put as much time and effort into, uh, into a course sometimes. Uh, and then we also looked at family responsibility. So we see that for 60% of them, they were not time consuming, but for 40% of them, they were. So meaning that maybe they were taking care of a parent at home, uh, maybe they have uh, children uh, and so forth. So that can also interfere with um, dedication to a certain course. We also see a gender bias because 86% of the students are uh, female students. And then in terms of their uh, experience with distance education, 66% uh, of them, it was their first time. However, um, the majority of them were very comfortable with the level of uh, technology, which, speak, which speaks to the demographic of the students. Questions about the sample? Gosh, I'm clear. Great. All right. So if we look at uh, our results, basically, um, again, you see a lot of numbers there, but if we sum it up, We've got the teaching presence, the social presence, the cognitive presence, and the learner presence. So students were answering the 48 questions on the questionnaire, and uh, based on their answers, uh, the numbers told us that the teaching presence was felt more by the face-to-face -face students than it was by the online students. Let me say that again. We've got students face-to-face -face with the teacher, students online. The ones who were with the teacher felt the teaching presence more than the ones who were online. Ideally, we would have liked everybody to feel that they had a similar perception of the teaching presence, of the social presence, of the cognitive presence, and of the learner presence. So, there are some limitations to the study before we start looking at the results, and it's important to note them. First of all, this is applicable over a semester. This was done in the winter semester of 2017. Um, when we talk about students' perceptions, um, is this the reality? Uh, we also saw before there's definitely a gender bias. There are more women enrolled in the course than there are men. 44% um, of the students were first-year students. So, um, you know, when students are first-year, even without distance education, um, they, they, they come from high school sometimes. Sometimes they, they, they come from a different program, but a lot of them will be coming from high school. And so, uh, you know, we need to reactivate that prior knowledge. Are they cognitively ready for stage up? There are, this could be a bias as well. Um, and then 66% of them were uh, experiencing this delivery mode for the first time. And the courses were taught by different teachers. So one of the teachers, it was their first time. Whereas another teacher, for example, he was there in 2007 when it all started. He was part of it. Um, you know, when, when, when he's teaching, people clap sometimes. So there's a difference between uh, the, the, the teachers that taught the three different groups and also their experience with this uh, delivery mode. So the results. Yes. Please, Anne-Marie, there is, there is yes, a question Anita. from Anita. Uh, she said, uh, when in semester did they do Very the good question. They did the questionnaire at the end of the semester. So the semester begins in uh, January and we finish in May. And uh, towards the end, so in April, uh, I passed the questionnaire. And the way we did this, it was all confidential um, and anonymous. The teacher was outside of the, the classroom and uh, students were filling out the questionnaire, putting it back in the envelope and then I got the results, so it was all um, anonymous as well. So they had the, the whole had experience had, yeah. of the course. So if we're talking about first-year students yeah. as a limitation, uh, it is a limitation, yes, but because it was in the winter semester, they, they, they still had had some experience with the uh, CIGEP system. Good question. Other questions? We're good. All right, so let's get to the, uh, the juice, uh, the core of the, the findings there. <clears throat> so basically, when we look at the teaching presence, instead of um, filling up my slide with an essay, uh, I've decided to use Wordle and uh, just throw in the keywords in there. Uh, of what came up, 
from uh, students' comments in the uh, about the teaching presence. Um, so one of the elements that came up was the uh, importance of discipline, uh, class discipline, um, and conflict among students. So I know that in a group there was a, there was a conflict between the uh, students at a distance and the students uh, face to face based on misunderstanding, miscommunication, uh, certain irritants as well, like the noise I was talking about uh, before. Students fa attending face-to-face -face found it very difficult because they had to be quiet all the time because, like I said, just moving a piece of paper uh, was very, very loud to the students attending uh, at a distance. Uh, sometimes students would feel misunderstood. Um, when, uh, for example, during the break, the teacher, some teachers had a lapel microphone, so they have it on their, um, their coat or their clothes. Uh, they would turn it off during the break, while the students at a distance felt like they were not part of the group. They felt like there was a, uh, a separation there. However, if the microphone was still on, they could hear everything that was uh, said. Um, and so it, it led to a bit of a division in some cases. The tone of the voice, the teacher's uh, tone of, of the voice is, is very, very important for students to feel like they're part of the group, like they're, uh, they're being welcome and they're being addressed directly. Um, also, the uh, topics and due dates, uh, a lot of students at a distance felt like those were not clear. Now, was it because of a, a technical issue or because of the fact that, you know, being at a distance you need a bit of repetition, maybe putting the information online? Uh, that's an interesting point as well. Um, and then uh, students really enjoyed to, when the teacher was very helpful, uh, when the teacher was taking the time to ask how everything was going, if there were any questions. Um, and also to give them feedback. Students, I mean, again, face-to-face -face or online, uh, students need to have feedback. But it seems like in the blended synchronous delivery mode, they enjoy to have it more often because they know where they stand. Uh, I remember, again, when I was a student in the MTP, you know, the uh, online student's introduction is, can you hear me, right? It, it's, it's a basic need to feel heard uh, and to be able to communicate. Um, and then also in terms of the teaching presence, some students mentioned the uh, additional cognitive load. So the fact that the teacher was at a uh, the distance for some students was an added uh, cognitive load. And so they mentioned the importance of face-to-face uh, -face visits, which is where institutional support comes in as, uh, comes in as well. Uh, because a lot of teachers were saying that when they start teaching, at, this, at the beginning of the semester, it's important that the teacher goes to the satellite site at least once to see the students, to talk to them, to establish that relationship. And they notice that there, there are less conflictual situations afterwards compared to when they don't go at all and everything happens uh, online all the time. Um, even some teachers were saying that a student is going to ask the same question in person that they ask online, but just because it's in person, it, they, it seems like they, 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 they understand better. Uh, they'll be even sometimes touching the teacher just to feel like he's real. So the importance of that, that first contact at the beginning uh, was said to be uh, very important. Um, administrative decisions also in terms of the teaching presence is very important to make sure that the teachers have all the technical support necessary to have that teaching presence felt. Um, and the nonverbal cues were, were cues were very important as well because when you're online, all you have really is is well, you have verbal, but you have a lot of nonverbal, and so teachers need to be aware of this when they're when they're uh, teaching a class, and uh, also the fact that some students can actually be very demanding because they don't know what to expect. So they're demanding of the teaching presence because they're used to being in class face to face along with their teacher and classmates. So when you throw in a camera and you add the blended synchronous delivery mode, um, uh, students need to be aware and have a discussion at the beginning of the semester with the teacher as to what is expected and how it's going to go. So this was for the teaching presence. Any questions at this point? Yeah. Excuse Yes, Maria, I have some questions um, from Susan. She said, "Do you find that the students at a distance, uh, at a distance, has a more difficult time actually understanding the the course material?" I suppose. Oh, it jumped. <laughs> um, because of technical issues. That's a issues. very good question. Like I said before, the idea is to make it in a way that we don't even feel that technological barrier. 
But when technical issues arise, then yes, this can interfere with students' perceptions of the teaching present. And that's why we really need to have strong institutional support to back it up so that you have a technician who's there to help when there's an issue. You've got back-channel communication if something happens so that students can, again, they're not deaf and blind all of a sudden. They, they can reach someone to say what's going on and what's, what is happening to them. So if it's done properly and there are no technical issues, no. But if it's not, if, if there are technical issues and there's no plan B, C, D, E, F, then yes, it can become an issue for students to understand because they feel the teaching presence less. And she adds issues like the students themselves not being able to that's master a, that's the technical That's a very, very software. good point because we'll get to that when we talk about the learner presence. Uh, it's the same if I go to class and I don't have my books and, uh, you know, I'm, 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 I'm not even looking at the teacher and I'm in a different room, you know. Uh, they, then I'm, I'm just not able to get information. I'm not able to learn because my learner presence is not there. So sort of the same idea. If some students have very little um, ease with technology, if we go back to that Maslow's pyramid from before, their basic needs are not even met. So there's a lot of anxiety and stress just as soon as they, like a, a student was telling me, they, when they know they have the, that blended synchronous delivery mode class, they are anxious maybe a day before, in the morning, until the class starts, until they see that the computer works, when they put their he headphones on, you know, can you hear me, can you see me? As long as they don't have that, their basic needs are not met. So yes, it's very important for students to, be, uh, to have some sort of support and to understand the technology. Very good question. And I would add to that is that uh, depending on the format of the blended synchronous, you know, you have you have some format where you have satellite a satellite site and you have a face-to-face -face site. So these technical issues and the softwares are less important, I would say, for students than uh, than the other format where you have multiple multiple people in uh, at home attending the course so they are left alone and if they have some technical issues uh, teachers or a tech support should be there to uh, at a distance to help them uh, and uh, is. this is really very important so in the case of the study of Anne Marie you had people at one side and uh, and uh, the others at um, That's it. at so face at the face to face side. Yes, they with a teacher, and then That's a group of case, students yeah. in Carleton uh, without a teacher. And now, when you have that group of students in Carleton together, they can troubleshoot together, right? They can try to share information. If one of them caught something and the other one caught something else, again, it's the blind man and the elephant metaphor. They can they can put that together, and it's it's helpful. But when you've got, let's say, a multi-site class where uh, you've got a student studying from Cécile, another one in their home in Limoilou, another one in uh, Sherbrooke, well, yes, you're right, Sassen, that's, that's a different reality. And that's where also institutions need to decide, where is that technical support? If it's 8 p.m. at night, um, first of all, is the student in, uh, in uh, Drummondville calling their CEGEP in Drummondville, or are they calling the number with the host CEGEP, which is in Gaspé? So all these need to be clarified right from the start. Um, and some teachers may even want to do a bit of, uh, of, of technical training first, or have a technical uh, technician come and do a bit of technical training with the students first. Because if we ignore this technical portion, it can always come back and you know, interfere with the learning experience. But if we acknowledge it and just make sure that everybody is on the same page, it lowers the risks of having interference with the learning experience. And I would like to add to that is um, in another research that I did with uh, people from uh, Gaspésie and from uh, Rimouski and so on from the FADIO project, uh, I did a focus group uh, with some people, with some students, and um, some of them complained uh, when they are from two sites, you know, the, the model with two sites, they, they complained a lot about the sound. 
they had some sound problems. Uh, they said uh, they said very often that that they they could not hear uh, very well what was said in the face to face class because uh, students uh, didn't switch off uh, their their uh, microphones, for example, uh, and so on. So I didn't leave. Uh, I didn't really leave the experience, but I have I had some some people telling me that the sound issue. Or was a it really can be, that's it. And that's why I was them. saying, thank you, Sassen, for that. Uh, I was saying, you know, uh, again, with the microphones uh, in, in the format I was looking at, um, if you drop a pencil, to them it was like dropping a bomb. That, that can be huge. I remember in the master teacher program, when they were trying to do activities to integrate the online students, that was all fantastic, you know, good-hearted, great. But then they would have the students on a device, let's say their iPad or their iPhone, um, talking to me online. So there were three students in class with the teacher, among the group of students in class with the teacher, who were working with me on, in a team. Well, forget it, I couldn't hear anything they were saying because of the background noise. So eventually they realized that, they took the students to another room, and then they could hear me, I could hear them. So it's, it's all those small details that can make a difference, and that will come with experience, but if we can share, you know, the experience that has been already done by a lot of people, then those are kinds of pitfalls that we can try to avoid. We have a, um, another question from Lee Ann. Uh, she says, uh, can you elaborate what you mean by two sites? You know, you lived that experience uh, in your CGEP. How does that work on the teacher's uh, end? Uh, so, I'm not sure I understand the question. I'll try to, Leanne, I'll try to answer what I understand. Uh, is that in Gaspé we have a classroom, and uh, there are some students in the class with the teacher. Then there's a, a camera, so video conferencing equipment installed. So there's a camera, there's a television, <clears throat> and a microphone. And then there are students three hours away, 300 kilometers away, in our other campus who are in class and who also have a camera, a microphone and a, and a television. And I, I told you before, right, that's like $50,000 worth of equipment. It's a big TV and a high quality camera. It's not those little webcams there. And the microphones are like hanging off the ceiling. Maybe I could show you a picture um, at the next presentation. And they're very high tech microphones. And the students at the satellite site are together in the classroom, but there's no teacher with them. So from the teaching uh, point of view, they're teaching in front of the class, if you will. Uh, they have the usually the television at the back of the class, so they see the students at a distance. Uh, and when they're speaking, they're, the, the students see them because the camera is also at the back of the class. So it's kind of like a regular class. However, it, is, it can be seen as discriminatory because you've got the face-to-face -face participants in the front and then the, ca the television with the distance participants at the back, which I'll get to this in a few minutes, but um, can also heighten sometimes the us versus them phenomenon that um, uh, one author was talking about. Does, does this answer your question, Mian? Or maybe you can, you can clarify it? Yeah. She said yes, yes. thank you. Uh, we have another yes. one. Uh, she says it's Anita. She says it is possible to switch the face to face side during the semester. I guess she wants to say that the teacher uh, Very good goes question. to yes. one uh, side to well, another. Well, like I said before, you know? uh, the teachers like if they can go to the satellite site, uh, they will because they enjoy doing that. They see that there's a difference after in the connection with the students. Uh, so yes, we've had teachers who, who do that. They basically uh, go to uh, Carleton, for example, and uh, then they're going to be teaching the class from Carleton. So the students in Gaspé experience what it's like to be at a distance. And that's one thing in the MTP that they did with us also, is that at least once per course, per uh, course in the semester, everybody had to be online. And so everybody could understand what we were going through as uh, online participants. And I will get to that uh, when I talk about the social presence and the learner presence, because that's what came up in the comments too, is the, the fact that some students feel like they don't un the, the other group doesn't understand their reality. 
And so by doing what, what, um, what Anita is asking, uh, whether we do that or not, by having the teacher go to the other site, then yes, the students in, uh, in the Gaspé campus, for example, become the satellite site and then they experience what it's like. So yes, it is definitely possible. And, but, but it requires uh, institutional support again because, well, the teacher has to drive there. And so in our case, 600 kilometers, sometimes the Magdalene Island, so it's a flight uh, and accommodation. And also it's time because if a teacher is teaching full time, right, uh, they get that 20% extra for their, uh, for their uh, blended uh, course, for example, but they still have a tight schedule. So let's say that their class is at 9 a.m. in the morning, uh, and then after that they teach another different course in the afternoon. They don't have time to go to Carleton, teach, and come back for the other face-to-face -face course, which is a, a different one. So logistical elements to take into consideration. But good question. Other questions, Austin? Not for now. Okay. No. Great. Again, I don't think hesitate. it's okay. I love those. And it's, it's great because it helps clarify uh, certain elements. Um, okay, good. So that was for the teaching presence. And like I said before, the research shows and even my research <laughs> reveals that this is a very central presence. It, it kind of connects to, not kind of, it connects to the other presences, the cognitive presence, the learner presence, and the social presence. And so it's very important for that teaching presence. And that's why Again, learning may not be optimal when you take that teaching presence uh, away or when it's not felt. And this is basically what our results found, is that the students at a distance did not feel, uh, did not perceive that teaching presence as strongly as the ones attending face-to-face. -face. So then when we're looking at the social presence, um, some students can feel neglected, they can feel isolated. Uh, they also said that sometimes the social cues are not clear. Uh, we all know that even in, in traditional face-to-face -face relationships, uh, sometimes there can be a misunderstanding. Uh, so through a camera, that can sometimes be um, a bit more complicated. And one of the teachers was saying that she felt like she had to verbalize a lot more. Because when you're face-to-face, -face, you can just go behind a student and just your presence is going to make them stop whatever they're doing that is not related to the course or you just give them a look and then they get it, right? But uh, in this format, you have to verbalize a lot more and you have to be very careful not to put the students on the spot either because you're really putting them on the spot. Uh, so some teachers were saying, for example, that unless it's something major, they will wait until the end of class, but they will address the issue right away. And that's what one of the teachers were telling me too, is that you, you have to nip it in the bud, basically. Don't wait. Don't wait until later in the semester because it's going to get worse from their experience. That's what they were saying. Um, and then it's important to, when we look at the social presence to define what is a group. What's a group? Because in, in the case of, uh, of the nursing program there, you, you can actually have inter-cohesion, social cohesion, and intra-social cohesion. And that was very interesting because you've got two groups, one in Gatsby with a teacher and one in Carleton without a teacher. If we want intra-group connection, we would ideally want them to connect with one another and have social cohesion, which is not always likely to happen. However, what can end up happening is what we call um, in intra-group connection. And so, again, as I was saying before, the fact that the teachers at, a, at the satellite site did not have a teacher present with them, of course, they felt less of a teaching presence, but they could help each other. They could uh, troubleshoot with each other. They could, so they became a group of their own. And that's very interesting because there was some social co cohesion, not inter, but intra. Um, and so they, they, like, they, they would seek effective support within their own group. And that's, that's necessary when you're, when you're learning. Um, right now, I'm still taking online courses with the uh, Université de Sherbrooke. And we put together, um, a com it's, it's asynchronous, so meaning that I learn on my own, but many people do too. And so we put a community of practice together here in Gaspé, and we meet online every week for an hour to discuss the course. Just that, I'm seeking effective support from that group. I'm able to discuss what I'm learning, negotiating, meeting, and this really helps learn. So either group cohesion, inter or intra, uh, was found to be uh, very important. 
Um, another element that the students mention is, is the importance of understanding each other's reality. And that's what I was saying before, is that sometimes there was a bit of frustration when the students online uh, did not understand the face-to-face -face students' reality and vice versa. And so this could lead to conflict. Social rules was also uh, an interesting aspect because um, the face-to-face -face students are on campus with the teacher. So they're following social rules established. However, the ones at a distance don't have a teacher in class and sometimes they're not even on a campus. So they can be eating food, they can be talking to one another, having their feet on the desk and so forth. This can be very irritating for the students attending face-to-face -face from the campus who are following the rules. So this can also create a bit of a, of a division. Uh, like I said before, also being on the spot, being called on the spot uh, was something that some students don't enjoy. And again, I remember as an MTP student, sometimes some teachers who were not very well versed with technology would forget about us online. And then, but I had questions and comments, but never they, did they see it. And then all of a sudden they would realize that I'm there and say, well, you know, do you have anything to add? So I was all of a sudden on the spot, which is not necessarily the time when you have something to say. So remembering that they're there at all times can help with that social presence. Um, and uh, the us versus them phenomenon also that I was talking about, if, if there's the social cohesion is not great, then it can definitely lead to this one group against another group, which happened in one of the, the groups that I was researching. Uh, and the teacher certainly had to intervene, but uh, they intervened a bit too late. And that's what I was talking about before, also nip it in the bud. Uh, and so it was very difficult to, to get that cohesion, social cohesion back. Um, and then technology, again, like I said, the noise can be a massive factor in that social co cohesion as well. If the students face to face, for example, feel like they have to be quiet all the time and they can't really do much, well, then they, they don't feel that connection with the other group. And same if the microphone is turned off uh, during social times, well, that's where we socialize and that's where we develop social cohesion. And so this was for the, uh, the social presence. Any questions at this point? Yes. Yes, I have two questions, uh, Anne-Marie. Uh, uh, the first one, inter is all from Susan. Inter is all intra in a particular group. And another one from uh, Zane. Hi, Zane. Was there any interaction or great, team great, great activities okay, between so the two groups? Intra is within your group. I've got two groups, one in Gaspé, one in Carleton. Intra, they interact separately. Inter is when they connect together. So if that's not clear, I can uh, clarify differently. And uh, uh, Zane's question. Yes, that's a very good question. Um, because we talk about blended uh, synchronous delivery mode. And so we're talking about synchronous activity happening in real time and asynchronous activities, which can happen outside of class, online, uh, through forums, uh, videos, uh, and so on. In the MTP, there was a lot of that. In the three groups, three courses, three sections that I looked at, there was nothing or very little happening asynchronously. So everything was happening in real class time. And so that was their only chance also to develop that social presence and that cohesion. Except maybe that, you know, through Mio's on Omnivox, uh, they, could, uh, they could communicate, but it had to be on their own, uh, you know, desire. So there were no forums, there was no, uh, let's say, required readings that they had to discuss. Uh, there were no videos presented online, so it was really all synchronous, but it's still blended because there were some, uh, let's say they had to submit their work online or they could communicate with the teacher via Omnivox. But this, this is a great question because this can make a big difference in, in the social presence, yes. And we have another one. Um... It's Anita. She said, does the number of students have an That's effect an on the student's question. sense of cohesion? Um, just speaking from experience in a face-to-face -face class, I've had, uh, I, I remember teaching an English as a second language course where I had two students and there was a lot more cohesion with those two students and myself than in a group of 24 students. Now online, 
I'm not sure, and maybe Sasson, you can uh, answer that question because you've done a lot more research, because that did not come up in my research, but I'm, I'd be interested to find out. Uh, from another research that I'm, I'm thinking about, uh, the number of students is very important and especially the number online. So if you have, let's say, three, four people online and let's say 15 perhaps uh, in face-to-face, -face, uh, that's, um, that's well. But if you have a large number of people online and and a large number of people in class, uh, this may be difficult to manage for the, for the, and that, that's what came up from my research on the MTP. And some of the instructors said that there is a magical number. Um, the magical number is, uh, let's say, uh, perhaps the 25% of people online and, some, and other people in class, because if you want to do some group work uh, and to uh, and to send people in small uh, in small classes to do some group work with people online, this is where uh, this goes very well. But if you have a lot of people online, and that's very it's, interesting. Uh, Logistically it's more speaking, difficult yes, for the instructors. And uh, yes. Yes, and, and you know, because the instructors have to think about all these kind of uh, things to make uh, the, the, the experience uh, more uh, interesting for, for students. Uh, I would like to, to add something about uh, the uh, distance courses in the CEGEP level. Uh, there is an article by uh, Bergeron, uh, who worked at Gaspé, uh, and uh, what she said in her article is that the format that are used uh, in the CEGEP levels uh, at the Gaspésie and, uh, you know, uh, Rimouski and so on, uh, she said that they are trying to reproduce the real classroom. So they are trying to have uh, all the interactions uh, of students uh, synchronous and not asynchronous because you know in the CEGEP level the the teachers are supposed to teach a certain number of uh, of time in a semester and um, whether it is at a distance or in a classroom and face to face they are supposed to do the, uh, their hours so the the formats that are used at the CEGEP level until now I'm not talking about CEGEP at distance but uh, in the Gaspésie and so on, uh, they are supposed to do all the hours, so the synchronous part of the course is very important. Perhaps we are going to come on with other models in the and future, you know this applies to but it is not the case well? now. Interesting. No, it doesn't apply, uh, apply to universities. So if we have, for example, a distance course, an online course, we have the freedom to do it uh, synchronously or asynchronously, and it depends on the objectives right. of the course, uh, uh, and, and that's it. So we have a lot of other questions, I think. Okay, they say very clear, interesting, thank you. Ide ideally, you should yes, have definitely. a balance. Yes, yes. You can't but you have to think yes. about it. That's it. You do. You, you, you have to think about it. And even at the MTP, in my research in the MTP, uh, an instructor said that when she, uh, when she or he didn't have enough people online, she sent some people from the face-to-face -face group online just to uh, to be able to do well, the that's activities. Well, that's very interesting uh, because I remember taking one MTP. Again, to, for those do who it. don't remember, MTP is the master yes. teacher program uh, with uh, Sherbrooke University. So it's basically learning um, uh, pedagogy for the CEGEP level. Uh, and I remember in the MTP, at one point, I was alone online, and everybody else was in the in the class. Um, 
in Montreal. And there was a huge feeling of isolation first before I even started the course because I, I knew I was going to be alone. Uh, but over time, that's it. The teacher found strategies to connect me with the students, including having some of the face students, uh, face to face students come online to be there with me. And then um, it's just it's small details that, that can make a difference. Yes. And striking that balance. Yes. Yeah. Uh, other questions or comments? There is one coming. Yes. yes. So for breakout those of you who are not familiar really with helps. breakout rooms, for example, right now we're uh, 13, so 15 participants. Uh, and I know that some of you, let's say Leanne, for example, or other people, there, there's people in the room, so you're not you know, it's named as one participant, which is Leanne Johnston, but then there are many participants in the room. Uh, but breakout rooms would be if I took the 15 participants and then divided it up and created virtual rooms. So I could be with Sasson and Emily and, uh, and Leanne and Marie-Claude together in a virtual room where we would discuss certain activities together that we have to do. And the teacher can come just like in a physical room and visit those virtual rooms. Uh, to uh, to you know comment answer questions and so forth so you end up doing group work but online and yes those definitely help a lot too and again it's about having a variety of teaching strategies so that it's not just the sage on stage banking model of education lecturing um, and we can do this online a lot which is great yes very good point Suzanne Susan from Janabat says, "Me too," which strengthened the social plunging uh, presence. Uh, yeah. They did not be MTP too. Yeah, uh, which strengthened the social She's still typing. Uh, belonging presence, feeling the uh, attending face to face in the MTP. Well, yes, and that's the opposite too. Like uh, because I was following the MTP from Gaspe, I was always at a distance, and so sometimes students face to face were asked to come online. But I was also required to go to Montreal for certain courses to see everybody face to face and participate. And that made, again, a very big difference um, because there is a, a level of connection that you can get online, but it's kind of a step up sometimes when you can be uh, in person. And again, that's why some teachers say that it's, it's best to go in person, see the students at the beginning of the semester students from the satellite site, just to create that connection. Yes, technology is wonderful, but it does have certain limitations. Yes. Uh, sorry, Anne-Marie, uh, Christine is reminding me uh, for the time on, on the... On not on the chat, but in text on my phone. <laughs> she said that it, uh, we have less than 20, 20 yeah. minutes yeah, yeah. Uh, left. Well done. Uh, we have six diapo. Thank you. Great. <laughs> so we have uh, if we move on to the, the last two questions, questions so. since there's not a lot, actually, what was interesting is that a lot of students are used to thinking about the teaching presence and the social presence. But if you ask them about the cognitive presence or the learner presence, metacognitive skills, knowing thyself, some of them are not there yet, and so that's why the next two are going to be shorter, which is perfect for our timing. Uh, but in terms of the cognitive presence, what came up was the cognitive load theory. Again, the cognitive load theory is very interesting. I got that from what they were saying. is the fact that, you know, you've got cognitively a load, and uh, it reaches a certain uh, maximum sometimes. So if, for example, your course is at the end of the day, and it's online, you can have your cognitive load maxed out before the teacher even starts talking, right? And so for some of them, the, the technology, the delivery mode added to that cognitive uh, load. Um, and some of them mentioned uh, that some, uh, when they were having purposeful online communities, they felt like they, 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 they had a, a better cognitive presence. So when there, there were communities online working on a specific project, this really helped them learn better then um, let's say putting together uh, people in a room just to chat about something. But they found that the delivery mode could be an obstacle to focus sometimes. So they, they felt a bit distracted. And I remember in the MTP, one of the teachers said, you know, when you're, when you're in this delivery mode, you have to be responsible enough to say, all right, my phone is off, my door is shut, 
and nobody is going to bother me for the next hour and I'm not going to go on my emails, Facebook or anything like that. But for some students, uh, it's, it's an obstacle to their focus. So this was for the cognitive presence. And the last one that I have here would be the learner presence. And the learner presence is, um, uh, you know, again, it stems with the teaching presence because the teaching presence helps students self-regulate, uh, develop metacognitive skills, see how they learn, what they learn. Uh, it helps activate prior knowledge as well. And so the technical issues interfered, interfered, interfered sometimes with the, the learner presence. Uh, it led to some issues for some students, including anxiety, uh, feeling sleepy or daydreaming because of the, the format. And again, we bring back that cognitive load theory. You know, maybe, maybe you, the, 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 the delivery mode can be an extra load for students. Uh, some admitted that they work last minute, so their, their self-regulation skills are not uh, entirely there yet, but that's their problem or issue. Uh, and then some students said they were very, very proud actually to have gone through a course uh, in the blended delivery mode <clears throat> and uh, to be succeeding. A lot of them said that it requires a lot of autonomy uh, and also time management skills. And uh, we noticed also in the, in the responses uh, demographic factors. So let's say a group at a certain satellite site where the socio-economic situation may be a bit more fragile, uh, don't necessarily have all the cognitive skills that uh, the other group would have in another region. And so that also impacts the, the, the quality, we'll say, of the, the learner presence. Uh, questions or comments at this point? Yeah, we have one, uh, one, I would imagine, for example, in langu language uh, learning levels, the cognitive load level theory yes, is very it. important. Exactly. Example harder. Yeah, and and uh, there's other, a lot of factors that can uh, influence this, including yeah. the nature of the course, the time of the day, the way that uh, the information is delivered. And we have to take that into consideration. And I think, like, this is just me, but I think that sometimes uh, you can lower that cognitive load just by doing something at the beginning of class, right? So taking that load off a little bit. So there are certain activities that I like to do with my students that are going to help if I have a class at the end of the day and I know that they just came from physics, biology, mathematics, and uh, French. Yes, that's a good point, Suzanne. All right, so I'm going to wrap it up with uh, final thoughts before we can take a, a few last questions. Um, Blended synchronous delivery mode is fantastic. It offers flexibility, access. You can have a greater uh, learning experience in certain instances, uh, and the learning outcomes also can be uh, enhanced. However, <clears throat> we don't do this at all costs. Uh, the, uh, the, the, the traditional teaching, lecturing, is also still necessary, depending on the course, depending on the material that we have to cover with the students. Uh, we can't just wing it either. Uh, you can't just copy and paste the course and then put a camera in there and expect uh, everything to go smoothly. Um, there's a need for proper preparation. There's a need for proper support uh, so that students have equal learning opportunities and uh, that uh, they also have access to equal learning uh, outcomes enhancement. Um, the technology also can be great. It can foster emotional presence, but it can also hinder emotional presence. So we have to pay close attention to how we do this. Um, and the idea in the end also is that the activities that we design, the course that we design, have to have meaningful and purposeful uh, learning activities. So they're not just activities that we're doing for the sake of it. In terms of technology, technology is a fantastic tool to make education accessible to everyone. Uh, however, we have to have plan B, C, D, E, F prepared just in case something happens and have back channels for communication for students who uh, who have issues, technical issues, and so those would be that, this would be my uh, my presentation for for today. Uh, just to sum up, it's all about design, balance, thinking differently. So thank you. If you have any questions, you can. Uh, I think that for we can turn the uh, enable the option for cameras to be turned on and microphones to be turned on, or we can still use the chat. So it's up to you how you want to ask your question. Christine, you can switch off.